started, I'm just going to introduce Connor just for a minute, but a lot of you uh, have know, watched him grow up, so um, that's pretty cool. Uh, he was a member of our church and uh, was involved as a young person in the congregation, and we're delighted that he's going to join us. He graduated from Meade High School, went to the University of Washington, and he had some very interesting internships there with Pfizer and New York University and Harvard. Um, he's now, as he said, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Berkeley and the University of California, San Francisco. Um, he works at the, at the laboratory of the 2020 Nobel Laureate, Dr. Jennifer Dowden. Um, and um, so we're delighted you're here, Connor, and we know that always when we have some kind of technology innovation, there's always some ethical issues related to that. We've even looked now at the ethical issues related to the plow. Uh, so we're interested in this technology and what you're uh, up to and some of the ethical issues involved. Thanks for coming. Great, well, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Um... I'll go ahead and start sharing. Um, okay. Okay. I think that's show up for everyone. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. Great. Thanks again for the introduction uh, and and for having me. Uh, it's it's good to see a lot of familiar faces and yeah, have the opportunity to to talk with you all. Uh, if anyone has questions uh, during the presentation, I'm more than happy to answer them throughout um, or you know, at the end uh, either way. So feel free to save your questions to the end or just interrupt. Um, yeah. So uh, as, as promised to a few other people, I, I wanted to quickly uh, show a few entertaining and, and mildly embarrassing photos. Uh, <laughs> the exact one Brenda was talking about in the, in the top left of of me and Alexander, who's here somewhere as well as Mary and Joseph. Um, but mostly I just wanted to say that, you know, as David mentioned, I've been, you know, part of the covenant community since I, you know, can, can remember. Uh, these are pictures from the nativity scene and camping trips and confirmations and, uh, you know, everything from VBS to, to barista I've done. Um, so it's really great to, to be back. Um, you know, even though it's virtually, uh, which is which is the new norm, I guess. But it's uh, great to great to see all of you, and yeah, be able to sort of be back with with Covenant and and hopefully uh, talk to you guys a little bit about about something new. So, um, so yeah, I'll just go through this really quickly because because Dave actually mentioned it. But yeah, I'm I'm not around Spokane uh, much anymore or, or at Covenant, uh, unfortunately, but. You know, I grew up in, in Spokane, uh, went to Mead High School, went across the state uh, to, to UW for, for my undergrad, uh, where I majored in bioengineering. Um, so it's really a field that is interested in medicine, but instead of, you know, working from patients, more on the development side, right? More on how we can research and develop medicine uh, rather than, you know, administer it to, to patients. And so mm -hmm. during my time, uh, I was lucky enough to do a few internships, uh, one at, at Pfizer, which is a very large pharmaceutical company, uh, you know, now pretty well known for their, uh, as one of the two companies with a, a COVID vaccine, as well as at uh, NYU and, and at Harvard. Uh, and these sort of opportunities all gave me, uh, you know, sense that I enjoyed research, that I enjoyed biomedical research, uh, and that I wanted to make a career out of it. And so, that has sort of led me to, uh, yes, to UC Berkeley, uh, where I'm currently a PhD student um, in, in about my fourth year now. Um, so I have a couple of years left, but uh, quite, quite in the thick of it. And so uh, what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit about the field that, that I work in as, as a graduate student at Berkeley. And so I want to sort of share some pictures and, and sort of, you know, frame, uh, give you guys an idea of, you know, some of these things I'm talking about. And so 
these are some pictures of this lab that I work in. Uh, so as a, as a graduate student, I don't really take many classes, you know, like a traditional sort of undergraduate, um, but more so I, I work in a laboratory, um, which are these, these photos in the middle here. So we have these um, big benches and computers where we do our experiments and, and computation. Um, our lab is uh, led by a professor. Um, she's this woman on the right, uh, not Cameron Diaz, but the person to the left of Cameron Diaz uh, is my uh, principal investigator, the person who leads this lab, uh, Jennifer Doudna. Uh, and yeah, we're a really big group. There's about 30 or, or 40 of us and it you know, span, spans from undergrads to uh, staff members, to PhD students, to you know, people who um, already have their, their PhD. And so there's some photos uh, you know, of our group over the years on the right. We have you know, pre-pandemic, of course, we've had barbecues and, and social things and uh, even a, a lab softball team. So it's a, you know, a lot of work, uh, but, but we have a lot of fun uh, and hang out as well. So this is sort of, you know, what my life has been like for, for the past four years. Um, but, you know, I wanted to mention that basically like, like everyone else, you know, this, this last year and, you know, sort of continuing on has been uh, a bit of an up and down and, and has been different. And so, you know, like most all other professions, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, we had to shut down as a lab, you know, we could sort of no longer go uh, in, in person. And so, but what was sort of unique for us was that um, because we had some of the knowledge and some of the equipment, uh, we were able to actually go in to start a, a COVID testing lab. Um, so this is some, some photos back from about March, April, 2020, um, where we were able to set up a, a testing facility um, to, to help diagnose uh, lower income and, and unmedically insured uh, folks in, in the East Bay. And so it's definitely not something that I had sort of ever expected to happen during you know, my graduate school, but um, that, you know, Probably, probably goes for everyone. Hello. Um, but for for all of you know the the you know tough challenges and tough surprises that happened last year, um, one particularly exciting one uh, that David also mentioned was that uh, my PI, my boss uh, Jennifer Downa, won the. Nobel Prize in Chemistry this this past fall. So this is, you know, regarded by many as sort of the um, highest prize in, in science. Uh, she was awarded it jointly with a, a French scientist uh, named Emmanuel Charpentier. And uh, she was, they were given it uh, in recognition for their contributions uh, and for developing uh, CRISPR gene editing, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today. So, you know, what, what is CRISPR, right? Maybe some of you have, have heard of it. it. It's one of these sort of few um, biological techniques or, or biological words that sort of uh, transcended into popular culture. And it's, you know, apparently JLo is, is making a, a TV series about it. Um, if anyone happened to see the movie Rampage uh, with, with The Rock, uh, it's sort of briefly mentioned in there. And, I guess it's sort of made its way into, into superhero movies um, as well. So it's, um, you know, it's what I'm gonna talk about, not from this movie context, but you know, what actually is this, this CRISPR? And so for, you know, from a scientist's point of view, uh, for us, CRISPR, we're really talking about it as a technology to do genome editing. And so what, what I mean by genome editing is this, this process or this ability or you know, also this hope um, that we can insert or delete or replace, right, sort of manipulate uh, an organism's DNA genome. And so I'm gonna take a, a sort of quick step back and, and you know, talk really briefly about you know, what, what is the genome, right? What is it that we're thinking about inserting or replacing or, or tinkering with here, right? And so um, this is just sort of a, a graphical picture of your chromosomes. Uh, so as, as humans, 
uh, most all of us have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And, you know, together, this is collectively um, our genome, right? And, and it includes the instructions that, you know, make uh, up everything, everything within our body, right? So these 23 pairs of chromosomes include the instructions, right, that are telling our body, you know, which eye color we have, uh, what density of, you know, different taste receptors you may have on your tongue. Uh, you know, it's, it's responsible for, you know, everything from, you know, going from a single cell into, you know, a growing fetus into a baby into, you know, growing adult human. So you can really think of, of your genome as, you know, your blueprint, right? Your instructions for, for us as humans. And so there's a, a bit of a hierarchy here, right? So as, as humans, uh, as adult humans, we're all sort of made up of, of cells, uh, some 15 trillion cells. Uh, each of these cells has these 23 pairs of chromosomes that I talked about that we call collectively, um, you know, our genome. Each of our genomes is, you know, slightly unique and is, you know, what's differentiating our hair color, our different hair colors, eye colors, heights, uh, everything like that. If you go a little bit um, deeper into the chromosome, it's it's made of DNA. So that's what I that's what I mean when I talk about you know a DNA genome, right? And so uh, DNA is four combinations of four different letters. Uh, you know you may have heard A, T, C, and G. Uh, and so together, your genome is about three billion DNA letters, right? So there's about three billion letters that are encoding the structure, uh, the instructions uh, for us as, as human individuals. Uh, and you can take some of these DNA letters and in sort of bigger sort of snippets, uh, we call those we call those genes. And so uh, sort of good analogy for, for thinking about this um, for, for those who, who may need it is sort of like a, a library. So this is a uh, picture of a library that's near and dear to, to my heart. Some people may recognize this is Suzelo's uh, reading room at, at UW. Um, but, you know, if you can imagine, let's say in this analogy, the human body is like a library, we would say that, you know, we have about 15 trillion books, right, in, in said library. Yeah, sorry. Uh, we can think of, of chromosomes, uh, you know, as chapters. Right, so each of these 15 trillion books would have 23 chapters, right? And then we can sort of go down to the very smallest entity uh, where we would call DNA, the individual letters, right? The individual letters that are making up all of these books, uh, which are our cells. And then we would consider genes to be like sentences, right? So strings of letters uh, that have some beginning and end and, and you know, make some sort of sense, right? Convey some sort of, some sort of information. So, you know, going back to what I mentioned before, when, when we're talking about CRISPR and we're talking about genome editing, uh, what, what we're really talking about here is being able to rewrite the instructions, being able to rewrite the blueprint that, you know, makes us as human beings. So, you know, a lot of people like to sort of make these cartoons where they're sort of imagining CRISPR gene editing as, you know, a pair of tweezers or, you know, a pencil and an eraser, right? Where we could literally go into this genome, right? You can imagine like a book, we can go in and, and erase certain things that we want to, and then we can go in and, you know, write new things or fix typos uh, or, or things like that. And so that's, that's really what we're, you know, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, genome editing. Um, and so sort of, you know, may, may beg the question, right? Why, why would we want to uh, mess with, with these instructions, right? Why, why change or why edit the genome? Uh, and really the big reason for that, uh, you know, at least from my point of view as, as a bioengineer and someone who's interested in, in medicine is uh, genetic diseases. So this is, you know, sort of a, a class of, of diseases that is, um, inherent to, to a person's instructions, right? It's essentially a error uh, in, in a person's genome uh, that is, you know, causing their, the instructions that, that make up them to be, you know, to have a, to have a fault uh, and to produce something that 
a normal normal healthy individual would not right so uh you know examples of of genetic diseases right diseases that are caused uh, inherently by our genome, by our, the instructions that, that make up us as humans are, you know, things like neurodegenerative diseases, uh, you know, cancer uh, is, is caused often by a accumulation of these errors in our genome uh, that lead to cells growing, uh, you know, uncontrollably and form muscular atrophy or, or sickle cell disease that I'll talk about a little bit later um, that are all genetic diseases. And one thing that I, that I want to mention, you know, one reason that we're really interested in genetic diseases is that most all of them are incurable, right? So as opposed to say infectious diseases, right? That are caused by something like a virus, uh, you know, you can be cured, right? You can have gotten infected by SARS-CoV-2 and then completely get, get rid of it. Uh, and be, you know, completely cured of, of an infectious disease. But for, for genetic diseases, because it's inherent uh, to our genome, because it's inherent to our body, oftentimes you can treat the symptoms of a disease, right? You can give medicine to sort of help with some of the side effects, uh, but you're never gonna actually correct the error that's in your body, right? You're never gonna actually correct uh, the cause of the disease. And so what we're hoping to do is find a new way where we can sort of usher in an age where we can correct this error and we can actually cure genetic diseases. And so uh, this is sort of the, the tool that, that we're talking about. Um, this is a, a molecule. There's sort of a cartoon picture on the left and, and a, you know, better sort of abstraction or what we think it may look like on the right. Um, when we're talking about, when I'm talking about CRISPR, um, I'm talking about sort of a, a technique or a set of tools. Um, and the actual thing that's doing the work here is a molecule, uh, you know, an, an enzyme, right? It's something microscopic um, that, that we can't see by eye uh, called Cas9. And so this is a, a two component system um, that you know, getting a little bit into the specifics here, so I don't expect everyone to, to remember this, but uh, for those who are interested, it's this two component system where uh, one component is sort of, we call it a guide RNA. Um, we think of it sort of as a, as a compass, as something that sort of uh, directs the, the homing of this technology to a very specific part of our genome, to a very specific part of our DNA instructions. And then the second component here is this actual molecule. Um, it's called, called Cas9. Uh, and you can think of it basically as a pair of, of molecular scissors, um, a, a tiny molecule that can actually cut your DNA. And so the really sort of popular um, example, uh, you know, scientists in, in this field like to give is that uh, CRISPR genome editing is really, really analogous to like word processing, right? It, it's, it's similar to, you know, opening up Microsoft Word on your computer uh, and going through and, you know, editing some, some document, some essay that you're working on, right? So, so in this example, you'd have uh, Cas9 uh, on the left. It has this particular guide RNA, right? It's sort of like a, a compass. It's, it's telling it where to go to. Um, and then in this analogy, uh, we have, you know, the human genome would be like your Word document, right? Except for this is a, you know, this is an essay that's three billion letters long, right? So it's, it's a very, very sort of long document. And so what we can do with, with CRISPR is, is, you know, analogous to the sort of um, word processing metaphor is that we can sort of control F, right? We can find uh, one particular sequence encoded by this compass right here in yellow, this guide RNA. Uh, it can, you know, sift through your giant Word document of a, of a human genome, find the exact same sequence, right? So in this case, we're talking about, you know, the same uh, DNA letters, right? C, G, C, T, so on and so forth. And then because Cas9 is this pair of molecular scissors, we can then cut that exact sequence out and then paste in something new, right? We can then sort of control V and, and put in a, 
a completely new set of, of DNA letters, right? And so this is really what we're talking about when we're talking about CRISPR, CRISPR genome editing. And so I have a quick video, let's see if we'll, it'll play. Okay, so this is a, a quick video uh, to sort of, again, sort of illustrate exactly what, I, what I'm talking about here, right? So we're looking at a cell here uh, as we zoom into a cell, this sort of blue spaghetti is your DNA, right? Is, is your genome, these instructions. Uh, and these purple blobs sort of, you know, swirling around are CRISPR, right? It's, it's Cas9 with this guide RNA. And so it's going around uh, looking for that one very particular sequence, right? That's sort of its, its homing beacon. Uh, and once it finds that sort of exact same match, Cas9 as a pair of molecular scissors cuts this DNA Right, so you've now sort of cut your instructions and now we can go in and we can put in a new sequence, right? So it's, so it's almost like surgery, right? We sort of think of it as, as genetic surgery. We can go to a particular spot that we're looking for. Uh, we can make a very precise cut uh, and then we can, you know, put in something new essentially, you know, hopefully fix it. So um, I just, you know, one, one last analogy here to sort of, you know, really talk about how, uh, you know, revolutionary or, or how sort of miraculous uh, this really is, is, you know, sort of best demonstrated by uh, a little bit of math. So, so bear with me. Um, you know, I guess this is, gave you a bit of a biology lesson. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know, my mom's a math teacher. So I gotta, I gotta keep it even here. Um, so uh, a little bit of math just to make a point here is this uh, image in the middle is probably very familiar with people. Um, this is uh, Les Mis, um, which is now a very popular book, uh, play, movie, so on. It's according to Wikipedia, at least, uh, the 26th longest book in the world. Um, so it's, it's you know, over 600,000 words, uh, it's like, you know, longer than Webster's English Dictionary. Uh, if you, you know, say the average French word is about five letters, then basically this book is, is about three million individual letters, right? So, so to, in comparison, the human genome that we talked about with its DNA letters, right, these A, T, Cs, and Gs is three billion letters, right? So that'd be the equivalent of, of some, you know, 1,000 copies of this 26th longest book in the world. And so basically the point I want to make here is, you know, how really mind blowing it is that this sort of CRISPR genome editing works, right? Because what, what, we're, what I'm essentially saying to you is that uh, this, this molecule, this tiny, you know, microscopic molecule that you can't see by eye um, can find essentially a single word, a single unique word uh, in, you know, a thousand copies of the 26th book in the world. Right, so if, if I wanted to, you know, be Cas9, if I wanted to do CRISPR genome editing myself, I would be looking for, you know, one, one very unique word, and I would have to, you know, flip through uh, a thousand copies of this, of this giant book until I found that one exact word. And then, you know, I'd go in with my, you know, pen or pencil and I'd, you know, erase it and I'd, I'd write in a new one, right? right. So it's, it's really an extraordinary process um, that, that this molecule is able to do, that this sort of technology uh, is, is able to do. And so, you know, to sort of get away from analogies here and talk about, you know, what, so how does this, you know, actually work, you know, not in books and pen and pencil, but how would this actually uh, potentially cure a, a genetic disease? Um, well, one really good example is uh, sickle cell disease. So sickle cell disease is a uh, disease of your red blood cells. Um, so this is a, you know, the cells that are circulating through your um, blood vessels. They're, you know, providing oxygen uh, to the different, you know, organs, tissues, cells in your body. Um, like everything else in your body, uh, they develop, you know, there are, there is a set of your genome, a set of instructions that are responsible for the production of healthy red blood cells. Um, but what happens in sickle cell disease is you have a single mutation and instead of these nice round red blood cells, 
you get these sort of sickle shaped, right? These sort of crescent moon shaped red blood cells. And um, this can cause a, a number of different issues in patients with sickle cell disease. Um, the sort of foremost being that this uh, sort of crescent moon sickle shaped red blood cells they tend to sort of clump together, they tend to aggregate, and they tend to, you know, essentially create blockages uh, within, a, within a patient's blood vessels. And so this, you know, can cause severe pain, it can cause, uh, you know, heart attacks, strokes, uh, you know, a number of, of different sort of medical conditions. And, you know, I want to sort of reiterate this point that the difference between a, a healthy individual's red blood cells and someone with this disease that causes a massive amount of pain and suffering is one single letter, right? So instead of this A here in green, instead you, you have one error and it's, and it's a T instead, right? So out of 3 billion letters, you know, 3 billion letters that make up the instructions, if you have one single error, one out of 3 billion, you go from having, you know, being completely healthy to having a disease that you know causes pain uh, and shorter life expectancy, right? So, the goal essentially uh, is that you know we can use CRISPR genome editing. Uh, we can give it this guide, right? We can tell it where to go to. So we can say you know go to the gene that is instructing these red blood cells. Because Cas9 is a pair of molecular scissors, we can cut out this error, right? We can sort of erase this, this error. And then we can put in the correction, right? We can then write in what we know to be the, the correct letter. And once we've fixed the, the instructions uh, for these red blood cells, your body will now produce uh, the correct cells, right? So instead of these sickle shaped shell cells, uh, they'll form you know, these round, healthy red blood cells. Um, which, you know, is essentially curing this, this disease. And so, you know, that may sound like, like science fiction, sounds sort of crazy, um, but this, the, the woman on the, on the right in this picture, uh, her name is Victoria Gray, and she um, has sickle cell disease and sort of made news a couple of years ago by being uh, the very first volunteer in a clinical trial uh, in the United States um, to be treated with this CRISPR genome editing. Uh, and so to sort of you know, give you guys all an idea of how her life has changed since this treatment, um, this is again, a clinical trial. So this is you know, something that they're testing out. This is not something that's widely available, but uh, before, before this treatment, uh, you know, when she suffered from sickle cell disease, uh, she averaged about seven hospitalizations per year uh, due to severe pain, right, from these sickled cells, uh, you know, creating blockages within her blood vessels. Uh, she, you know, took powerful narcotics uh, for pain relief, uh, and she had to have regular blood transfusions, right? She had to sort of get blood um, from other healthy individuals on a regular basis. But after uh, doctors and, and researchers used CRISPR uh, to genetically edit her cells, right, to fix uh, this error in her genome uh, to date. So, you know, in, in a little under two years, uh, she has ha no longer had any severe pain episodes. Uh, she no longer, you know, thus has to take painkillers uh, and she no longer needs regular blood transfusions, right? So it, it may be sort of a little early to um, declare victory, but essentially, she has been cured of her genetic disease, right? Of a disease that was caused by an error that she was born with. Uh, she's lived with her whole life. She's now seemingly uh, cured from that. Not just sort of, the symptoms aren't just sort of treated, right? She's not just taking more painkillers, but they actually fixed what was wrong with, within her body. And so, you know, this is sort of extremely exciting and, and you know, where we hope to be with uh, you know a lot of different genetic diseases uh, is to be able to you know have this cure, uh, make this sort of permanent permanent fix. And so you know I'll, I'll sort of transition into you know what's maybe the more sort of interesting part of 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 this talk and, and of this topic in general, and that's really you know many of you are probably thinking already of 
the ethical issues uh, with with a technology like this, right, or or with a medicine like this. And so, obviously, there's there's a lot of um, you know medical you know great medical cures that that could occur. You know, I think we would all agree that you know something like sickle cell disease is you know causes a massive amount of pain and suffering, and you know it'd be great if we could cure it. Um, but you know where the line starts to get blurry is the fact that there are a lot of other things uh, caused by your genetics, right? Caused by your instructions um, that some may consider detrimental and some may, you know, not consider a disease, right? And so this is where the, the ethical questions really start to play in and where we really start to have to have these discussions. And, and some you know, examples of this are, you know, developmental disorders, um, things like autism or, or Down syndrome. Um, the picture on the, on the top right is, is from a fairly famous um, testimonial uh, to, to Congress by Frank Stevens, uh, who's a um, Special Olympian and uh, advocate and actor um, who sort of famously gave this, this testimonial in front of Congress saying, you know, I'm a man, man with Down syndrome and, and my life is worth living, right? And so, you know, things like Down syndrome are caused uh, by a person's genetics, by their genome. And so, you know, the really tough ethical question is, you know, some people may want to change this. Some people may want to edit this. Some people, you know, Frank including, may, you know, not consider this detrimental, not consider this disease and, you know, be against editing things like this. Right. Other examples are, uh, you know, non sort of, uh, you know, diseases that, that may not kill a person. They, they may be, you know, inconvenient. They may make life a bit tougher, uh, but they're not lethal. Right. So something like blindness or, or deafness or color blindness. Right. It really sort of presents a, a difficult question of, you know, do we use this technology? Do we use gene editing to, uh, you know, revert color blindness, let's say? You know, it may not you know lead to a shorter life expectancy, um, but if we could do it, should we? Um, another example is you know dwarfism, and so this uh, the woman on the bottom right, her name is Rebecca Coakley, um, and she uh, had a had a nice quote uh, from a documentary saying you know that she doesn't suffer from dwarfism, right? She suffers from how society treats her, right? And so there's this this big question about you know what what is a disease, right? Or, or what should we edit or what should we fix, right? Is, is everything worth fixing and, and who should decide? And so uh, I'm gonna sort of, you know, break down sort of the, the way we think about this ethically um, a, a little bit more and sort of go through these four quadrants just sort of briefly with you all. Um, and so when we, you know, at least as researchers and uh, scientists uh, in this field, think about uh, genome editing and the ethics of it, we really sort of break it down into these four quadrants. And so in this, in this first quadrant, um, in this, you know, top row, leftmost column, we're talking about treatments, right? We're, so we're talking about a, you know, medical procedure, something that is addressing a, you know, disease that clearly is causing, you know, pain and suffering. Uh, and we're talking about doing it in, in non-heritable cells. So what I mean by non-heritable cells are cells in our body, um, you know, your blood, muscle, heart, lung, basically everything uh, except for your sperm and egg, right, your reproductive cells. Um, because if I were to make a change to, say, my lung cells, uh, none of those cells, none of that DNA gets passed on to my progeny, right? So if I make an edit to, you know, say Victoria Gray's case, if you make an edit to the instructions in her blood cells, um, that will not be passed on to her kids or to her kids' kids or, or so on and so forth, right? So Victoria Gray's case would be uh, sort of the, the ideal case that would fit in this sort of first box, right? Where where treating a disease, you know, we're treating, we're reducing suffering, um, but we're doing it in a non-heritable fashion, something that can't be passed on. What gets a little bit more controversial um, with, with many people is this idea of, again, sort of doing this genome editing uh, as a treatment, right, as a medical procedure to, to reduce, uh, you know, 
suffering, um, but doing it in heritable cells, right? So this would be our, our reproductive cells, um, our, our sperm or egg. Um, and so, you, you know, you may ask, you know, why would, why would you want to do this in reproductive cells? Well, you know, much like how vaccines have eradicated some diseases um, from, you know, the face of this planet, if we were to use genome editing, say on sickle cell disease uh, in reproductive cells, we would essentially prevent people's kids from having sickle cell disease and then prevent their kids' kids from having sickle cell disease. And theoretically, we could eradicate genetic diseases from our, from our, you know, from our planet, right? We could essentially imagine a world in which, you know, we, no one is born with sickle cell disease, right? Or, or no one is born with Parkinson's disease or, or something like that. Obviously, you know, there's some controversy here because, you know, we are talking about changing future generations, right? We're talking about changing the instructions uh, of, of mankind from here in, into the future, right? And so that's an idea that, you know, many people are uncomfortable with and, and you know, rightfully so to, to a certain extent. Uh, what gets, you know, a little bit more controversial, even, even more so is this sort of bottom row where now we're talking about enhancements instead of treatments, right? So now we're not talking about, um, you know, curing a disease or, or ending a suffering. Uh, we're talking about making some sort of almost like cosmetic change. So, so a lot of people think of this almost as like genetic plastic surgery, right? So, you know, I, I you know, try to work out when I can, you know, try to stay healthy, uh, you know, try to, you know, put, a, put on some muscle. Well, imagine, you know, that's, that's a lot of hard work, right? Going to the gym, you know, lifting weights, running, whatever. What if I could just treat myself with CRISPR genome editing and you know, your muscle cells have instructions that tell them how big to be. So what if I could change those instructions? I could tell them to be bigger, right? That would be so much easier than you know, going for a run or, or you know, going and working out, right? So you know, this is obviously controversial, right? Because uh, you know, imagine a, a world where people could decide to, you know, have an injection of CRISPR genome editing and, and, you know, change their eye color or, you know, decide that they want to put on a bunch of muscle mass or, you know, things like that. And so this is, you know, what I'm talking about when, when we're talking about enhancement here. Um, again, you know, in this sort of left, bottom left quadrant, we're talking about non-heritable enhancements, right? So if I were to edit my muscles, you know, give myself, you know, giant muscles, uh, my muscle cells would not go on to my children, right? So my children wouldn't have giant muscles, right? Or if I changed my eye color, that wouldn't affect my children, right? Because my eye cells uh, don't, you know, go on to my progeny or, or, or my progeny's progeny. And so, you know, obviously this is leading to this last quadrant, which is, uh, you know, by far the most controversial. And it's this idea of people have sort of coined it as uh, designer babies. Right, so it's almost like uh, the movie Gattaca, if, if some of you have seen that, right, where we're sort of picking and choosing the characteristics of, of our kids, essentially, right? Because we're, we're talking about enhancements here. So we're not talking about uh, treating a disease. We're talking about changing eye color, changing hair color, changing you know, muscle mass or height, right? Um, because we can change these instructions that make us as human beings, and then we're talking about, you know, in this, in this far right column, doing this in a heritable sense, right? Doing this in your reproductive cells, in your sperm and egg cells um, that, you know, will get passed on to your kids and your kids' kids and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, this is a very sort of slippery slope where you can imagine, you know, you can very quickly sort of change humanity, right? You could change the gene pool, this, this set of genetics that sort of make us up as, as humans, right? And the big sort of controversy here and, and rightly so is, okay, well, you know, if everyone decides for their kids to have green eyes, are we gonna push ourselves into a future where all humans have green eyes, right? Because everyone's kids are gonna have green eyes, everyone's kids' kids are gonna have green eyes, and then soon, you know, no one is gonna have brown eyes or blue eyes. And there's, you know, a little bit of sort of a slippery slope projection there, but 
it's it's imaginable uh, with, with this technology. And so I think, you know, another question that, that we get and, and, you know, we think of oftentimes with genetics and is probably, you know, most pertinent um, to, to this group of folks uh, than, you know, probably any other group of folks that, that I've talked to is, you know, really this idea of is genome editing uh, allowing man, allowing someone to play God, right, to play this, this role of God and, and, you know, deciding how humans are to be. Right, and so um, this is unfortunately a, a picture. Uh, this man in the middle is a, a Chinese scientist uh, named J.K. He, um, and he actually sort of in secret, uh, without anyone knowing, uh, used CRISPR genome editing uh, to edit um, the embryos of a couple uh, that were implanted via uh, in vitro fertilization uh, and resulted in the birth of, of twins. And so these, you know, to the best of our knowledge, are the very first uh, genetically modified human beings on our planet. And so, you know, I want to, again, sort of reiterate that uh, this was, you know, condoned by, you know, a lot of people, you know, basically the whole sort of scientific body uh, was very upset that he sort of, you know, he did this in Rogue, he did this without you know, ask anyone, telling anyone, um, you know, everyone thought this was, you know, way too early, that this, you know, it was a sort of mistake and that he didn't consider any of the ethics or any of the implications um, from, from what he had done. But it doesn't sort of, you know, change the fact that it's out there, right? It, it can be done. People with this sort of know-how and this, uh, you know, the right sort of reagents um, can, can do this, right? And so it, obviously creates a, a bunch of sort of ethical uh, conundrums and, and questions, which, you know, I'm sure you all are sort of thinking about right now. And, and you know, a big one is, is, you know, what I've talked about before, right? Who should, who should decide, right? Who should decide who gets to be gene edited? Who should decide what sort of genetic conditions should or shouldn't be edited? You know, is this, you know, what about the unborn children? parents, our governments deciding this, you know, scientists, um, you know, religious figureheads, who, who's going to sort of make these decisions, mm -hmm. right? And the other really tough part here is, you know, from a purely logistical point of view, uh, how do we regulate this? You know, if, if this becomes a, a thing in, in our world, in our society, how do we regulate this idea of genetic editing humans? Right, so if let's say uh, you know a, a country like China, uh, let's say, decides that they are allowing you know genome editing in heritable cells and re reproductive cells, but let's say the United States decides not to use it, right? Well, how do we really put national boundaries on something like this, right? Because obviously, you know, people you know move and immigrate from country to country, and they are bringing along with them you know, their genome, right? And their potentially genetically edited genome, right? So how do we really regulate, uh, you know, people, right? Because that's, that's the material we're talking about here when we're talking about genome editing. And so really it's, it's tough to sort of imagine national borders, you know, on this or, or a set of regulations that sort of fits one country and not, and, and you know, has no effect on the other country. This really is, you know, affecting uh, us as humans, as a entire species, you know, no matter where you are on this planet. So um, there's a really big and difficult sort of logistical dilemma there. And, you know, how do we regulate this? Can we come to some sort of, you know, international um, consensus, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and so I want to sort of briefly end and, and sort of leave some time uh, for questions um, at the end of my presentation here with a a uh, slightly cheerier note, uh, hopefully more optimistic note. Um, that's that's just to say that you know I've been talking exclusively about humans here, uh, but CRISPR and genome editing can happen in any living organism, right? So we're as humans, we're not the only things with DNA. We're not the only things with a genome, right? All animals have DNA. You know, insects and crops. Uh, plants, right, are also have DNA, also have a genome that instructs how plants grow. And so this picture here 
on, on the left is, you know, a, a normal vine of tomatoes, you know, which I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with. And then the picture just to its right is a uh, variety of tomatoes that were genome edited uh, with, with CRISPR to essentially bear more fruit. Right, so this picture kind of is, you know, pretty evident, right, that this vine is now producing, you know, what, four or five times more fruit, right? And so why might we want to do this, right? Why might we want to edit these crops? Well, for things like, you know, increasing, uh, you know, crop nutrition, let's say, of the individual fruit, um, or, you know, like this image, increasing yield, right? And so what, what a lot of experts uh, worry about is, you know, this graph on the right is, is just the sort of illustrate the fact that, you know, over the years, um, you know, as a society, all these different countries, as a human population, as we continue to grow in numbers and people continue to live longer and longer, we are consuming more and more food. Um, and there's a, a serious worry that uh, the production of food in, in the world will not be able to keep up with the growth in our population. Right. And obviously, you know, it's a pretty easy equation there. If we have, you know, too many people and not enough food, you know, we're going to cause suffering, food shortages, starvation. Uh, and so that's, you know, a massive sort of global worry and one that could potentially be addressed uh, by genetically modifying the crops we already have, right, to be more nutritious or to bear more fruit or, you know, to be drought or infection resistant. Um, such that, you know, we don't lose uh, sort of whole harvests. And so, uh, you know, I want to leave you with sort of one last thing, and, and that's a quote that, that I had heard from, from Walter Isaacson. Uh, he's a former sort of CEO of CNN uh, and, and biographer. Um, and so if, if you take just one thing from this presentation, uh, I hope it's this, and it's that Walter Isaacson said that, you know, in the last about century, uh, we'll, we've had about three great innovation revolutions, right? And so the first uh, was, you know, the atom, uh, you know, a lot of, was done by Albert Einstein in, in 1905. Um, and, you know, his sort of discovery or characterization of our, you know, the smallest entity that makes up our universe has had, you know, massive implications in our life, right? Everything from um, the atom bomb to GPS and satellite and space travel, right? So that's what he says is sort of one of the, one of the first great innovation revolutions of, of this past century. The next being the bit, right? And so this is, you know, bi binary programming, right? This is, you know, the advent of the internet, you know, the cloud, uh, you know, microchips, right? The, the, the iPhone that's in, you know, many of our pockets. Um, this was, you know, sort of the, the next sort of massive innovation revolution it is, you know, the bit and programming and, and being able to have personal computing. Uh, and what he and many others says are, is sort of the next sort of oncoming revolution is, is the gene, right? So it's, it's understanding um, what we are as humans, right? What sort of our makeup is, what sort of these instructions are uh, and, how we can sort of change it and how we can sort of, you know, fix errors, right? So, so the first thing that sort of happened was our ability to read genes, right? Our ability to read genomes. And so um, if any of you have done something like 23andMe uh, where, you know, you, you spit in a tube and you send that to a lab, they are reading your genes, right? And using that to tell you something about your medical history or, or your ancestry and so that sort of happened in the early 2000s, right? Our ability to read genes. Um, but this sort of new advent and what CRISPR will play a role on is sort of this next wave in this revolution, which is us being able to write genes or rewrite genes, right? To be able to fix, um, put in, you know, remove bad things, put in new things, uh, really into the instructions that, that make us as, as humans. Uh, and so I'm gonna skip through a couple of these last ones uh, for, for time's sake, um, but just put out there, if anyone is you know, really interested in this topic and, and would like to learn more about it, um, there's some great resources out there. Um, the, there's a couple of different shows and documentaries on, on Netflix. Um, one is called Explained, uh, the other is called Human Nature. 
um, both do a, a really great job of sort of giving a, a very sort of lucid um, explanation of, you know, CRISPR genome editing and medicine and the ethics behind it as well. Um, and for those, you know, who may want to read more about it, um, there's a, a couple books, one by the uh, biographer I just mentioned, Walter Isaacson, uh, called The Code Breaker, um, which, you know, talks about this, you know, next great genetic revolution. Uh, and another uh, that was actually written by my boss, uh, A Crack in Creation. And that's sort of a firsthand account of, you know, how this technology was developed uh, and where it may, may lead in, in the future. And so with that, uh, I'd like to, you know, thank you all again for, for listening and for having me. Uh, and I'm happy to sort of take any, any questions or, or talk about anything that um, people may find interesting. So yeah, thank you. Hey, Connor. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is Gordon Misko. Uh, just a question on like Victoria's situation. Is that uh, cast nine, is it sort of permanent or does it have to be refreshed and uh, uh, periodically to keep it uh, active? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And so um, the cast nine, the, the CRISPR in her body is not permanent. Right, so like a lot of medicines, you know, we we take it, it does a job, and it goes away. Um, but the the really fantastic thing about genome editing is that, you know, presumably she will not have to take it again. She will not have to take a second dose, right? Because what's happened is in her genome, in you know these instructions and coding for her red blood cells, uh, they have made a a permanent change. Right, they, ha they have permanently uh, fixed the mutation and she now you know, permanently for the rest of her life has the uh, correct instructions. So presumably, theoretically for the rest of her life, she will now produce uh, these healthy red blood cells. And so she, yeah, it it's not something right where she'll have to take it every month or every year. It is theoretically a, a one-time treatment where she is now cured and, and will never have to uh, retake any sort of CRISPR genome editing again. That would not go on to the next generation then? In her case, no. In her case, it would not um, because they edited her blood cells, right? The, the cells in her blood vessels and those cells uh, do not get passed on to your children, right? The only cells that get passed on to your children are your reproductive cells. So your, your sperm or your egg. Um, so if you are, you know, doing genome editing in your lungs, let's say for cystic fibrosis or in the brain for Parkinson's or uh, in the muscle for like muscular atrophy diseases, uh, none of those would get passed along to your children or any future generations. Yeah, Don. Yeah, I, I, I'm Don Tomlinson and I, my question to you is, uh, in order to uh, like treat this lady that had the sickle cell anemia, how do you, do you don't you first have to isolate the, the, the instructions for correctly forming red blood cells so that you know, know what you're looking for when, you, when you're analyzing her red blood cells, you know what you're looking for so you know what you have to replace. Exactly, yeah, and, and, and that's, a, that's a really good point. And so, um, what, what happened in the early 2000s uh, was something called the Human Genome Project. And so this was a, a huge effort by you know, tons of scientists over uh, like I think a couple of decades where essentially they were doing exactly what you were saying. They were essentially just trying to read the human genome, right? So the whole point of this giant project was just to figure out what are the DNA letters that make us as human beings. Right, because because we need a reference, right? You can't you can't fix something or you can't correct something without knowing what the correction is or knowing what the reference is. And so um, that was sort of the start of this sort of genetics revolution, and that sort of happened in the early two thousands um, and still continues to happen. But you know, the advent of that is that we now know the instructions that make up uh, you know healthy genes. Right, so if anyone has done any of these sort of genetic testing um, uh, companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or, or something like that, that is all completely dependent on the fact that we've already 
read the human genome and we already sort of know, you know, what does a healthy gene look like? And because we have that reference, we now know, you know, what the incorrect one looks like and, you know, what we should revert it back to, right? Um, you know, one thing that, that I'll know on, the, on that topic is that our, our knowledge of, of genetics is not complete. Right, so sickle cell is a uh, really great uh, example because we know the exact uh, genetic mutation. We know the exact error that causes that disease, uh, but there's a lot of others like uh, Alzheimer's. We don't know, you know, the exact gene that's involved, right? There may be some genetics, there may be some environment involved, uh, things like multiple sclerosis, right? Like, like MS. We don't know exactly uh, the genetic cause of it. So if we don't know the genetic cause, um, it is you know, hard to fix without that reference, which, which is sort of to your point, Don. So, so are you still doing the, doing for, for these things that you mentioned like uh, uh, Alzheimer's and things like that, are you still doing the, the mapping for that, trying to, find, trying to find where the bad gene is? Yeah, yeah, that's sort of a, you know, whole different field of research. And, and you know, that's sort of genetics. Um, and, you know, people continue to try to discover the genes involved with, you know, all sorts of all sorts of genetic diseases. Um, a, another point, I guess, that I'll that I'll make while we're sort of on this topic is that a lot of features are uh, not instructed by like one single part of your genome, right? So again, Sickle cell disease is, is a really good example, a really nice example to talk about because there literally is uh, one DNA letter that is incorrect that causes this disease. But obviously there's a lot of traits that are influenced by a lot of different genes, right? So, so a lot of times, you know, when, when I talk to people, people wonder about, oh, can I use CRISPR genome editing to make myself more intelligent, right? Or, or to make myself more athletic. Right? Can I like turn myself into, into Michael Jordan? That one is, is not so much, right? Because there's no single gene that you know makes Michael Jordan Michael Jordan, right? There, there's no gene that just, you know, if you have it, you're you know super smart. If you don't have it, you're not so smart. Right. That's probably influenced by hundreds, if not thousands, of genes that are, you know, playing a role in, let's say, intelligence in memory, you know, brain size, neural connectivity, all, all those sort of things, right? So anytime you have more things you would have to edit and ones that we don't completely understand, it's, you know, less and less likely that we would ever be able to genetically engineer that. Um, so, so this idea of us being able to genetically engineer someone to, you know, have a higher IQ or, you know, to ace their SATs, uh, is, is, you know, a bit fictitious. Thank you. In the bit revolution, hackers have arisen, mischief makers. Uh, is that conceivable in this, in gene editing too, that, that someone could just deliberately try to make mischief? Um, yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, the unfortunate answer to your question is yes. Um, I, I think that is probably the case for, you know, any technology, right? I mean, you could argue that people have caused mischief with physics and the atom. You could argue that people have, you know, made mischief with the bit and programming and hackers. Anytime there's a powerful technology, there's always going to be a danger of misuse, right? And so the one example I have given is, is you know, a as we know of, uh, there is, you know, a single scientist uh, who, is, who is from China who, you know, used CRISPR genome editing to, uh, you know, genetically change two twins, right? Two twins that were born a couple of years ago uh, and are, you know, presumably living and, and have this genetic change. And, you know, I think most everyone, especially in the scientific community, was you know very against that right w would not have permitted that would have never done that themselves um you know said you know even if we were to do something like that it was way too early we didn't understand it well enough 
but you know he had the know how he had the knowledge he had the know-how he had the equipment um and you know he was a scientist he was a smart guy he thought he was doing it for you know for for good um and so you know he he did it um and, and so this idea of how we could put possibly even conceive of regulating that uh, is, is a difficult one, but presumably anyone with the knowledge and, and know-how could do this, right? And they, they could, you know, spur what anyone else says and, and they could use it for enhancements or they could use it in reproductive cells that get passed on to the next generations. Um, that is, yeah, not, not an inconceivable thing. Um, Connor, how how did Virginia Gray receive? How does a person receive that treatment? Or the mm -hmm. you know your diagrams of the little scissors are wonderful, but mm -hmm. how how does it happen practically? Yeah, yeah, and so um, yeah, so so how this sort of happens practically is again this. Uh, this all happens at you know the the microscopic scale right so yeah. this is nothing that we can actually see um but if you were to see it you would be massively mm -hmm. underwhelmed i can tell you that um you know what we're talking about here is you know they're essentially uh colorless liquids right that that have crispr components in them right that have cas9 in it um you know and the way in, in victoria gray's case um, you have a certain subset of, of your cells um, called stem cells in your body. Uh, they are sort of the, the precursor there, sort of what produces all these red blood cells. And so the nice thing about blood cells is that you can take them out of a person without killing them, right? You can, you can just put a, a needle into someone's vein. You can extract these cells and then we can sort of uh, manipulate them outside of someone's body, right? So in, in that case, uh, we use a couple of different techniques to uh, deliver Cas9, which again, if, if you're trying to imagine it, it would just be a completely colorless liquid. So nothing uh, too exciting. And we would you know, essentially mix that with her cells uh, outside of her body. And then you know, we would hook up an, an IV to her, right? And, and just put those blood cells right back into her. Um, so that's, for sickle cell disease, that was an option, right? Where we could sort of take out the cells, uh, you know, fix them and then put them back in her and, and that totally works. Obviously with, with other diseases, say uh, neurodegenerative brain disease, you don't really have that luxury, right? You can't really take out someone's brain, fix it and then put it back, you know, a couple of weeks later. And so, in that case, um, there's still a lot of development to be done, honestly, um, but imaginably it would be something like an injection. It would be something like a uh, intracranial injection where you inject a very small amount of liquid that contains you know, CRISPR gene editing components like Cas9, um, and then it would you know, get into your brain cells and it would uh, edit your brain cells. And so that's a much more difficult process, right? To sort of do it within someone's body, um, but you know, would most likely have to be the case for your brain or your lungs or your heart or, or anything like that. Yeah. Connor? Yeah. Uh, for your PhD uh, um, that you're going for, are you working on any, anything specific in gene editing? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so in my case in particular, um, for, I work completely in sort of this, you know, very broad umbrella of, of CRISPR genome editing, but for me in particular, things that, that I'm interested in, um, one is on a, a project that I'm working on with uh, your immune cells, and so it's this uh, idea, and, and there's some, you know, a lot of other people doing a similar thing where, um, your immune cells in your body are very good at sort of recognizing, their whole job is to recognize bad things in your body, right? If, if you get you know, infected by a virus, 
it's their job to sort of, you know, destroy the cells that are infected or destroy the virus, right? That's sort of the whole idea behind uh, if, you know, if some of you have had the COVID-19 vaccine, right, you're producing an immune response to, you know, attack uh, sort of foreign bad things within your body. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, genetically engineer your immune cells to recognize um, other bad cells, uh, not ones that are infected by a virus, but to uh, recognize cancer cells. Um, so immune cells don't normally do this very well, but since we can, you know, change the instructions, since we can tell, you know, change the, the thing that's telling them what to do, we can, you know, manipulate them to say, you know, recognize this sort of cancer cell, you know, don't recognize this sort of normal cancer cell and, you know, kill or destroy this cancer cell, but, but not anything else. And so um, that's, that's the sort of part of this, the, this CRISPR genome editing field that, that I'm working in, yeah. Connor, since the uh, sickle cell amenia, uh, whatever it is, um, is so effective, are they choosing a lot of people to have that procedure? Um, there are numerous clinical trials going on. Um, it's, it's the first sort of disease that's being targeted in the United States. Um, and that's for the couple of reasons that I mentioned, the fact that you know, we know the gene, the fact that there's only a single error that we have to correct, right? right. So it's much easier than if there's like 10. Um, I don't know the exact number of patients that are in these clinical trials, um, but I know that a couple different uh, institutions are doing clinical trials, you know, and recruiting volunteers with sickle cell disease um, to be treated. And so uh, my university, uh, UC, UC Berkeley, UC San Francisco and UCLA, um, they have a sort of joint uh, clinical trial that, that they had just started uh, to do a very similar thing to, to treat people with sickle cell disease. Um, so I don't know of an exact number, but there are multiple groups, multiple people uh, doing this and, you know, presumably, hopefully hundreds, you know, if not thousands of people eventually, um, because, you know, there are still safety concerns, right? So, so like everything else, just like the COVID vaccines, mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to do a robust clinical trial, you know, make sure it's efficient, make sure it's uh, specific and safe. And then, you know, it, it may hopefully become a, um, yeah, regular, you know, approved, FDA approved treatment. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Thank so, you. Yeah. So when you, when you get your, uh, your, your PhD, is it gonna, gonna, you're gonna have two certificates, one from USF and one from Berkeley? Uh, I'm actually not sure. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm enough years away from that that I, I haven't thought about that yet, but hopefully, yeah. So Connor, is there um, a certain cancer that um, you are looking at because it's going to be easier to do the um, research on and, and see some results right yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Right, um, right now, the sort of cancers that, that we're looking at are presumably all uh, blood cancers. Mm -hmm. So like lymphomas and leukemias, right? So in that case, the you know cancer cells are are circulating throughout your body in your blood vessels rather than you know being sort of like a solid tumor uh, in any particular organ, and that's a little bit easier for us to target as a first stage because your you know your immune cells are already sort of circulating through your blood vessel, yeah. right? So we're basically trying to train or or change these immune cells that are you know coursing through your veins to say hey if you happen to see something like this in your blood vessel it's cancer, you should try to destroy it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's leukemias and lymphomas. Hmm. Manu? Yeah. Uh, I always have a heart for uh, muscular dystrophy. Could this genetic thing help cure that? Yeah, yeah, it, it could actually. And yeah. so there's a, there's a lot of people doing research into muscular dystrophy. Um, and so there's, a lot of different, you know, muscular dystrophy are, are genetic diseases um, that, you know, cause your muscle cells to sort of die or, or atrophy over time. 
Uh, and, you know, anytime there's a genetic cause, uh, you know, there's a possibility that that CRISPR genome editing could do that. Uh, and so I know for a fact, at least, I don't think there's any clinical trials for it, but I know people have done this in uh, animals. Um, you, can, you can have mice or actually even dogs, so slightly bigger animals that um, also have mus muscular dystrophy, also have a you know, gene that is causing their muscles to, to atrophy over time. Uh, and they have uh, essentially injected, right, just like with a syringe, uh, CRISPR genome editing you know, into muscle tissue uh, and seeing that it can get into muscle cells, it can edit muscle cells, and you know, once you have the correct instructions, uh, your body, your muscles will presumably, you know, do the right thing, and you know, you could tell it to, you know, live and, and be healthy rather than uh, than atrophy. So I know people have done that uh, in mice and and in dogs, and that there's certainly a hope that um, it could be translated, you know, into the clinic for for humans. I'm praying that that happens because I looked up your. Uh, boy that died at 22 of muscle yeah. muscle dystrophy. Yeah, yeah, there, there are some. And so kind of from a logistical standpoint, uh, you know, all of the very first diseases that people are interested in, in going after with CRISPR genome editing are all, you know, ones like, like Peggy had mentioned, ones that are, you know, extremely life-threatening, ones that, you know, cause a lot of pain, a lot of, a lot of suffering, you know, dramatically reduce someone's life expectancy, right? So the hope at least is that, you know, even though we talk about this ethics of, you know, changing eye color or, you know, changing your height or, you know, different sort of enhancements like that, the real hope is that at least at first, you know, people will be focused on, you know, real diseases, real things that cause suffering, um, you know, like you had mentioned, like, like muscular atrophy, um, that can be, you know, completely debilitating and can lead to, you know, a, a very reduced life expectancy. Um, so that's really the hope in the field, you know, really my hope in the field as sort of a, someone who's interested in biomedicine. Um, and so hopefully those will be the, yeah, first things that happen or the sort of most knowledge and, and resources will be put into, into things like that, actual diseases. You know, from a yeah, social yeah. science perspective, this could be incredibly important because it has great implications for the cost of medical care, for the treatment of all kinds of things from a, a, a revenue perspective. So even social scientists are gonna be really, really interested in the trajectory of this kind of research. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I will say as it sort of uh, starts now because everything's in this sort of, you know, research and development, uh, therapies that are like this uh, are still very expensive. Um, you know, the hope is that, you know, like with everything, right, with, like with computers um, that, you know, over time as this becomes more and more per pervasive, it'll get cheaper and cheaper. Right, but but like you had said, with with social scientists and you know economists who'd be interested in this, um, and you know as I sort of talked about with with Gordon is that you know you go from say with sickle cell disease, someone who needs you know hot you know multiple hospitalizations every year, uh, blood transfusions, medicines, right? From a purely you know a, suffering aside, from a purely logistical standpoint, that is a you know massive burden on the healthcare system right, those sort of chronic diseases. And so if we have a, you know, single injection that would cure you, that you only have to take once, and then you are cured for the next X number of years of your life, uh, mm -hmm. that would, you know, massively have some sort of relief on, uh, on yeah, economics and, and the healthcare system and, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound as though the ethical questions are really dominant. Uh, or that it's mostly just like a win-win. Um. Uh, I mean, there, there are some serious ethical concerns that, that people have, uh, and, and I think rightfully so. Um, you know, I, like a big one is, you know, when I've talked about, you know, what, what do we all sort of, you know, consider of, of the genetic conditions, what do we consider a disease or not, 
right? So some people may to choose to edit genetic conditions like say Down syndrome, or some may decide not to. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know if it's necessarily exactly a win-win, um, but we do, you know, have the technology, I guess, or, or have the possibility or ability to. If we have time for one last question, uh, Dave, you are muted, so maybe you want to end it. I don't know. <laughs> but Connor, just a quick one. Do you happen to know if there's any um, group that is addressing these uh, the ethical side? Often uh, there'll be panels or they'll bring together ethicists and others to try to look at this. Uh, so do you happen to know if there's any groups, institutions, channels that are doing that? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Presumably, um, it, it's all a lot of uh, conferences, like you imagined. Um, so I'm sure there are some groups, labs, social scientists labs that are, uh, you know, completely focusing on this. But really, when it when it comes up most is at yeah these conferences. Um, and so actually, the the image I had showed of of this Chinese scientist J.K. Ha, um, who, yeah, announced that he had you know genetically edited these twins. Uh, that came about at a conference, right? So a convening of, you know, uh, international convening of scientists and physicians and advocacy groups and, um, you know, researchers. Uh, and so oftentimes at conferences like this, which, you know, they have in different countries and they also have international ones as well. Um, you know, they have panels and, and they make um, these you know, try to have these discussions uh, about these ethical implications. Uh, people have made, uh, groups have made, uh, like, I guess, declarations, I'll, I'll call them. Uh, you know, people have, you know, prominent yeah, scientists in the field, prominent ethicists in the field have, you know, put out papers with suggestions, right? They're, they're not binding at all, obviously, to anyone, but, you know, People have said, you know, as, as this group of prominent scientists and physicians and ethicists, you know, we argue, let's say, against editing inheritable cells, or, you know, we, you know, they, they argue certain points, um, and those sort of get widely publicized, um, and those sort of stem from, from conferences, or, you know, when people meet and, and have these discussions, but, you know, they're, they're just, uh, you know, words on, on paper, they're just a, a recommendation or, or an opinion. Uh, they have no sort of legally binding, uh, no one's sort of legally obligated or legally bound to them. And no one no, I think we're I think we're out of time. So we better um, we so appreciate Connor your clarity and your willingness to join us. It's been great. I think everybody would give a big hand. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you all for, for having me. Um, if, if anyone has more questions, uh, you're welcome to, you know, my parents are here, they, they have my email, they can uh, gladly pass it along and, and I'm happy to, yeah, talk with anyone else if anyone else has any questions or, or comments. Um, but yeah, thanks again for, for having me. It was, it was great to see everyone and, and talk with you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. You. So interesting. Take care, everyone. Have a, have a good Bye. Sunday. Bye-bye.